Red Dead Redemption 2 is ultimately a story about people. Even though most Red Dead vets knew what was going to happen to the Vandalin gang from the events of the previous game, Rockstar still threw plenty of surprising curveballs our way. Here's a look at the ending of Red Dead Redemption 2. In an early mission, Lone Shark Leopold Strauss tasked protagonist Arthur Morgan with collecting a debt from Thomas Downs, a poor farmer with a bad cough. The short exchange between Arthur and Thomas seems minuscule in the context of Red Dead Redemption 2's escapades, or even the other debt collection missions, but it's integral to the main plot. Thomas' single cough in Arthur's face would ultimately result in Arthur getting diagnosed with tuberculosis in Chapter 5. Basically, a single cough sentences our anti-hero to death. You owe him, you took the money. He wants it back, what's not to understand? <laughs> After the TB diagnosis, Arthur changes. He's no longer the rough-and-tumble outlaw keen on leaving everybody to their own fate, and his interactions become much more, well, pleasant. Instead of being driven by money, he just tries to do the right thing for the people around him. Leave the boy alone. Why'd you kill his daddy? You after his mama? <laughs> Stop bullying the boy. He encourages John Marston to take his wife and son and run away from the gang for their safety. He also lets Strauss's last debtors go. He even kicks the insatiable loan shark out of camp. This is arguably one of the biggest changes ever seen in a Rockstar character, one that could act as a strong template for the developer's future protagonists. As Arthur's personality changes throughout the game, so does Dutch's, just not in the same way. Both John and Arthur initially described Dutch as an idealist, a cunning Robin Hood-like frontman who wanted to maintain the freedoms of the Wild West and hold off America's greed-fueled industrialized taming. Dutch spent his entire life trying to be a philosophical outlaw with a plan, but both history and the game prove his crusade was futile. In the end, the world had changed, and it had changed him with it, he just didn't realize it. With all of this happening, you would think that Dutch would be empathetic to the plight of the Wapiti tribe of Native Americans, who are being systematically pushed off their land. Nope, Dutch simply treats them as pawns for another heist. The leader who cared about the poor and disenfranchised sheds another layer of his identity, revealing himself to be a money-obsessed man of power, which puts him in the same lot as Leviticus Cornwall and Angelo Bronte, as influential people who exploit those beneath them in order to get rich. You ask me to show compassion. Have I not shown you almost infinite compassion already by simply allowing you to breathe in my presence? Even worse is how Dutch treats the Marstons, who are supposed to be like family to him. Both Abigail and John are captured during the Saint Denis bank heist, but Dutch refuses to stage a rescue, knowing they'd likely hang. When Sadie Adler and Arthur rescue John, Dutch rebukes them, despite wanting Arthur to free both Micah Bell and Sean Maguire earlier in the game. Loyalty, Arthur, it ain't. I had a goddamn plan! Arthur's rescue of Abigail resulted in the revelation that Micah was a Pinkerton's informant, who all the while was buzzing around in Dutch's ear. Right after Arthur accuses Micah and the Pinkertons arrive, the game gives the player a choice. Help John get back to his family, or head back to camp to retrieve the heist money. Sadly, Arthur never walks away from either choice. If you go back for the money, Micah will knife fight Arthur in the camp's burning remains. If you help John get away, Micah will fist fight Arthur on a mountaintop. Oh, Dutch. He's right. You know it, and I know it. Both of these fights with Micah have different outcomes depending on your honor. If you go back for the money with low honor, Micah stabs Arthur to death. With high honor, Micah runs away after losing an eye, and Arthur dies in peace. If you help John escape or having low honor, Micah will shoot Arthur in the head. Having high honor at this part results in a similar ending of Micah running away, but with Arthur seeing one serene final sunrise in peace during his dying breath. Also, depending on your honor, you'll get an ending of Arthur's recurring dream sequences featuring either a deer getting enveloped in light or a wolf in a storm fading into the dark. Similar to the first Red Dead Redemption making a grown-up, super-gloomy, revenge-driven Jack Marston the playable character after John's death, this game's epilogue puts you in the boots of John, who is trying to make an honest living with his wife and son years after Arthur's passing. Unfortunately, John keeps resorting to guns for various reasons, because, you know, the Wild West, resulting in Abigail leaving with Jack since she believes the outlaw gunman in her husband will never die. I hoped you would change. We all saw what happened to them that didn't, but you... 
part of you is hellbent on ending up the same way. To try and win his family back, John eventually buys land at Beecher's Hope, and with help from remaining gang members, Charles Smith and Uncle, they build the house the Marstons owned in the first game. As John Marston's story suggests, living as a farmhand rancher during this time was full of low-paying, tough work. Honestly, hard-working Americans were mostly unable to prosper during this time. John's turn towards bounty hunting with Sadie to pay off his loans is a grim reminder that the gunslinger inside him is who he truly is, despite his attempts to suppress it for a more wholesome way of life. This is a major theme of both games. Spreading civilization and gaining prosperity in the Wild West usually involve the deaths of many, many people. The good, the bad, and everyone in between. Dutch's gang might have broken up, but its members can still be found throughout the map, if you know where to look. Simon Pearson can be found running the general store in Rhodes. Tilly Jackson can be found in Saint Denis, married to a lawyer and visibly pregnant. Mary Beth Gaskill became a successful novelist and can be found at the Valentine train station. Reverend Orville Swanson, who sobered himself up both from alcohol and drug addiction and quietly left the gang during Chapter 6, is mentioned in a newspaper article, detailing his rise to ranks as a highly successful minister in New York. I'm a changed man, Arthur. I won't die over some nonsense spouted by a fool. Unfortunately, the whereabouts of Karen Jones, who descended into alcoholism near the end, are unknown. Though in a letter to John, Tilly suggests that it was this very vice that did the young woman in. There are also nine graves to be found for the deceased members of the Vandalin gang. While not part of the gang, Eagle Fly's grave can be also found. He lies at Donna Falls, not far from Arthur's own final resting place. The ending of the Red Dead Redemption 2's epilogue culminates in a final standoff with Dutch emerging from Micah's shack on Mount Hagen, having recently partnered up with him for the first time since Arthur's death. With everyone engaged in a Mexican standoff and with Sadie gravely wounded, John pleads with Dutch to say something in regards to Arthur, Micah's betrayal, and the whole mess at hand. Come on now, Micah! At least die like a man! <laughs> Hellfire! <laughs> It's just like old times. Dutch, the man known for his words, confesses he has nothing to say, but he sticks around just long enough to help John kill Micah before wandering off into the wilderness. After checking the shack, John finds the gang's collected high score that Dutch knowingly left for John and Sade, the remaining members of his gang. The game's credits depict what happens after the epilogue, showing Pinkerton agent turned Bureau of Investigation director Edgar Ross and Agent Fordman in various locations. They find Micah's corpse and even track the Marstons to Beecher's Hope. This sets up the events leading into the first game, where the two kidnap Jack and Abigail and force John to hunt down the remaining gang members at large. By the end of the game, Dutch has lost many of the key characteristics he proudly boasted during the first half. You know, before he was doing things like blatantly leaving members of his posse to die? His transformation is similar to that of Kurtz in Joseph Conrad's novel Heart of Darkness and its film reimagining Apocalypse Now. Dutch was a leader known for his philosophy, charisma, and words, but he has multiple layers to him, and the savage within him emerges over and over again. Like during the instance when he needlessly killed an innocent woman during the Blackwater robbery. His multiple failures and setbacks combined with years of recluse in the mountains results in the broken man we met near the end of the first game. He commits suicide, refusing to hand himself over to John and Edgar Ross, because he wanted to die on his own terms and not the establishments. My whole life, all I ever did was fight. Then give up, Dutch! But I can't give up, neither. His final words to John reveal his paradoxical core having failed to suppress both the changes in the world and his own savage nature. Of course, his last words also foreshadow Ross's betrayal and ultimately John's death. Our time has passed, John. An easily missed conversation option with Rain's fall reveals a startling revelation. Arthur had a son. As Arthur's TB worsens, he tells Rain Falls about Eliza, a waitress Arthur was involved with in his younger days. Admitting he genuinely liked their son Isaac, Arthur would visit and give them money sporadically throughout the years, despite the outlaw life he was already living. He found out they were both killed for just $10, which made Arthur embrace his sinister and savage side even more. Similar to the good deeds he does near the end of his life, telling this story he provides a sense of catharsis and helps him find his true self beneath the scumbag he was for all those years. I had a son once, years ago. Don't talk about him much. 
Arthur's tendency to shy away from talking about the deaths of his loved ones is reminiscent of John Marston's refusal to talk about Arthur's sacrifice with his family during a later conversation. While John has had problems expressing himself, especially during the awkward exchanges with his son, this is yet another RDR protagonist suppressing his sorrowful emotions. John's reluctance to talk about Arthur could explain why he was never mentioned in the first game, despite the enormous sacrifice he made for the Marstons. Throughout Red Dead Redemption 2, watching little Jack interact with the rowdy members of Dutch's gang is a highlight in a game full of them. As a little boy, Jack witnessed people dying, endured all kinds of hardships, and lived throughout numerous attacks on Dutch's camp by the O'Driscolls and Pinkertons. He was even kidnapped by the Braithwaite family. All of this, combined with John's pretty crappy parenting skills, results in Jack being a bit of a bookish recluse during his teenage years. Jack's upbringing with the gang in the second game and his father's death in the first manner Fest and the lone cowboy we meet in Red Dead Redemption's epilogue. The fact that Jack first met Ross while fishing at a river with Arthur is an excellent callback to where Jack kills him years later. While America did tame the West, Jack became a gunman just for the sake of getting revenge on Ross. This is proof that the Wild West spirit endured in a few remaining people. It all calls back to the tagline of both games that Dutch would occasionally mention at camp, Outlaws to the End. 